From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Communities across Arizona are having mixed reactions about Red for Red while the school funding debate is still up in the air. Plus how March for Our Lives organizers in Phoenix are standing up to the backlash against their beliefs in person and online. And how one family is using their son's story to help prevent teen suicide. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Gabriel Gamino. And I'm Nicole Costantino. Thank you for joining us. In a matter of hours, we'll learn if Arizona teachers have voted to walk out of their classrooms. In a vote held by Arizona Educators United, teachers decided what day and how long the walkout would be. Cronkite News reporter Megan Myers spoke with Valley teachers about their support of this movement. We are going to act as one body as far across the state as we possibly can to, act, to remain united and do this as one. Peoria teacher Melissa Germscheid is just one of the many Arizona educators ready to take a stand and walk out over school funding. Several school districts have released contingency plans to parents. Many hoped a shutdown won't happen. Germscheid assures parents that regardless of tonight's vote, her students will remain her top priority. In every teacher's mind, it's all about our kids. What about our kids? What are our kids going to do that day? We would never, we would never physically walk out on them, leave them alone, or not give parents notice. The Red for Ed movement has been going strong for nearly five weeks, and teachers say the governor's 20% raise proposal does not help the needs of all educators, including counselors, specialists, and even textbooks and building maintenance. One Valley parent says teachers are offering a good lesson. The things that our kids are learning about in their history books are coming to life right before them, that they can be a part of that, that their teachers are a part of that, that they're witnessing something that could be um, potentially huge as far as how things get changed in a better direction for our state. Results of the walkout vote are expected by 8 tonight. In Phoenix, Megan Meyer, Cronkite News. And while support for the Red for Red movement is sweeping through the state, including cities outside of Maricopa County. Cronkite News reporter Madison Stark traveled to Lake Havasu and found out that not all communities are signing on. Local businesses are putting up signs, stickers are being posted on cars, and community members are wearing red shirts in support of their teachers, students, and schools in the district. A movement school board member Kathy Cox says is unprecedented in Lake Havasu. It was just wonderful to know that we've got the support of the town. And I, I took some signs around the other day and uh, I had several people say, well, what, what took you so long? We've been waiting for this sign. Two years ago, the city passed a bond and override to increase teacher salaries for the first time in more than a decade. But teachers like Shannon Williams say the funding problems lie elsewhere. We need to change the per pupil funding is what needs to happen so that the kids can have textbooks that are not outdated and chairs that aren't broken. On Tuesday night, community members attended the monthly school board meeting where a decision was going to be made about recognizing and supporting the Red for Ed movement in Lake Havasu at the state level. Many concerned teachers, students, parents and residents attended the meeting sharing their opinions on the matter, but the board voted against the recognition letter in a two to one majority vote. At this point, I'm sad for the students in our community. I'm sorry their educators would rather march and strike than propose solutions. I do not support the Red for Ed movement and I won't sign the letter, but I do support the people in this town. I support you. And the fight is not over. The kids in this town deserve an education to do and be what they want to. And if we don't fund education, they're not going to have those chances. In Lake Havasu City, Madison Stark, Cronkite News. Today, Senate committee held its first hearing on Governor Doug Ducey's school safety plan. The bill was set to be heard by the Senate Commerce and Public Safety Committee on Monday, but was postponed for changes. Ducey proposed his original school safety plan in mid-March, which increases the number of school resource officers and spending on mental health counseling. But changes today strengthened the wording about proposed stop orders of protection, which would allow the government to remove firearms from people ruled dangerous by a judge. The bill sponsor, Senator Steve Smith, said he knows he still needs public input before any law is signed. You know, how many times have you heard this? Well, they passed something in the middle of the night. They, they didn't get my input. They didn't ask me what I thought. They didn't ask my group what we thought. Yeah, well, that's all changing. <laughs> 
Tomorrow on the anniversary of Columbine Massacre, students are walking out in protest of violence in schools. Besides fighting in person, students involved in the Phoenix March for Our Lives movement are also fighting online bullies. Cronkite News reporter Imani Stevens shares their reactions. People calling me fat and scrawny, that I need to go back to school, that I'm dumb. Social media. It's a platform for people to connect. A lot of the comments I was receiving was from people that I've known for a long time, had a relationship sh relationship with and have worked with. This group of high school students say they've seen the negative side of it. We gave the students a few of the comments from their social media accounts to read aloud. These little morons don't even know that they are not safe anymore. We do know that we're not safe anymore. Uh, that's why we are here doing this. Is this guy here illegally? It's a question for my parents. 17-year-old Jacob Martinez says he's now grown used to it. When I first came out with this, it was kind of hard because it was it just came nonstop. Associate Professor of Social Technologies Alexander Halavis says it's a cultural shift. Even if it's not anonymous, it's also not face-to-face. -face. So I think it, it's still been my experience, at, pe at least, that people who who behave this way online are less likely to do so face to face. With some of these messages going beyond social media, a junior in high school, Jordan Harp, says a threatening fax was sent to his school. Threatened me and my safety. Uh, I never read it. My mom just decided that it was best if I not see it. But people have been going out of their way to make, make, make me aware that they are watching me. But the negative comments aren't stopping the change they want to make. I strongly believe that the conversation can only move forward when these people in the comment section, the people making laws even, come to the table ready to compromise and understand the other side because we're here, we're waiting. I am very, very proud of all of you. Please keep this momentum go going. Change is on the horizon. Thank you. It is people like you who keep us doing this every single day. And it's comments like this that keep them fighting. In Phoenix, Imani Stevens, Cronkite News. Our community in Gilbert is hoping to heal after Higley High School sophomore Jacob Sanchez committed suicide 10 days ago. Reporter Izzy, uh, Sydney Eisenberg spoke with Jacob's family on how they say his death could save others. Outside of the same high school where Jacob attended, Jacob's friends and family gathered to hand out suicide resource cards and to remind students and anyone passing by that they are not alone. Last night I was downstairs by myself and I swear I could hear him scream mom and it just, it's not real yet. I know it's real, but it doesn't feel real. Jacob was 16 years old. He was described by his loved ones as funny, silly, and kind-hearted. He put everybody before himself. He never really showed what he was going through because, you know, he didn't want people to worry about him. He wanted to, like, worry about others. Jacob is just one of a growing list of Arizona teens who have committed suicide this year. According to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, Arizona ranked 12th in 2015 for suicides. 56 teens died from suicide in 2016. Since the start of the current school year in July, Christina Wynn of Project Connect 4, an organization that creates awareness, prevention, and postvention for teen suicide, says 23 teens have lost their lives. That's a classroom full of kids. That's 23 empty chairs that these teachers see, these students see, these parents know are there. Never in a million years did I ever think I would be planning a funeral for my 16-year-old son. Now Jacob's family is using his death to help others. This morning, they and others stood outside of Higley High School in Gilbert, holding signs of love and comfort. If they're struggling, that people are here, that they're loved, that, that people are listening, that we want to help. In 2015, suicide was the leading cause of death for people ages 10 through 14 and the second leading cause of death for people ages 15 through 34 in Arizona, according to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. In downtown Phoenix, Sydney Eisenberg, Cronkite News. Nearly 25,000 people have signed an online petition calling for the release of Alejandra Pablos, a nationally recognized organizer who has been in detention in Arizona for a month and a half. Earlier, an immigration judge decided whether she would remain in custody or be set free. 
cheers erupted after it was announced today activist Alejandro Pablos would be released on bond. A crowd of family and supporters gathered outside the Eloy Detention Center where she was being held. It's incredibly important for people to know what a great person Alejandra Pablos is. She is an activist in both reproductive health care and immigration spaces and she has done so much. Pablo's case making national headlines after she was detained by Immigration and Customs Enforcement on March 7th in retaliation, activists say, for protesting the Department of Homeland Security at a rally in Virginia earlier this year. Pablos was placed in deportation proceedings, losing her legal permanent resident status more than two years following a drug-related arrest and a driving under the influence charge. While Pablo's family members and supporters are celebrating the release of her grant on bond, they are doing so with hesitation. They say because ICE has the option to appeal the ruling. We, we know that we can't celebrate until Ale is physically with us. Bond was set to $8,000 and she was expected to be released later today. The fact that the judge uh, set the bond so low, I think he sent a clear message that my sister should have never been there. In Eloy, Alexis Berdine, Cronkite News. Pablo supporters say she transformed her life after her convictions, dedicating her life since then to being an activist. They're also planning on sending Governor Doug Ducey a petition to grant Pablo's a pardon. 20 years ago, immigration courts faced a backlog of more than 129,000 cases. Now that number has risen to more than 680,000 cases. Cronkite News reporter Shelby Lindsay has details from our Washington Bureau. In a Senate hearing on immigration courts this week, Illinois Senator Dick Durbin said the Justice Department is getting rid of one program that has helped. 2012 DOJ report demonstrated that LOP reduced the amount of time to complete immigration proceedings by an average of 12 days. The LOP is the Legal Orientation Program. It saved the federal government an estimated $18 million by educating detained immigrants about their rights, which helps resolve cases faster. But the program has been put on hold by the Trump administration. Durbin pointed to Nicole Fish, a mother of two whose fiance would have faced deportation without LOP. During his detention, Nicole went to early labor and gave birth to their now two-year-old son, Tommy. Edar received a presentation from LOP attorneys who realized he had a legal claim to stay here. Without LOP, Edar could have been deported to El Salvador. Instead, he's here to support his two children. James McHenry III, the director of the Executive Office for Immigration Review, told lawmakers that his agency is taking steps to speed up cases. EOR is addressing its biggest challenges by working to enhance immigration judge productivity, improving the hiring process in order to bring on new judges more quickly, and moving to an electronic case and filing system. Texas Senator John Cornyn said judges alone aren't to blame. We need then to fix the loopholes in current laws that hamper the government's ability to bar criminals, gang members, and sex offenders from entering the United States or from being removed. Cornyn said that Congress also bears some of the blame for not giving courts all of the resources that they need. While many problems were laid out, so no solutions were agreed on. Live in Washington, Shelby Lindsay, Cronkite News. With even more troops deployed to Arizona's southern border, both local and national officials are saying military action is long overdue and still not enough. Lillian Donahue went to San Luis, Arizona for an update. Walls work. This has been proven. Department of Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen called the situation on the U.S.-Mexico border a crisis after a brief tour in California and Arizona. The secretary standing firm in the president's continued plans in building a wall and deploying thousands of National Guard troops to the border. You have the professionals of the Border Patrol who for decades have been on the border and have seen what works and doesn't work, and this is what they're saying that they need. Officials say there's still more demand than supply with National Guard troops, and so they expect more in the future. But for now, it will be capped at 440 troops on the ground in Arizona. Governor Doug Ducey praised this military action along the border. Recent action by our federal government to secure our southern border is welcome 
appreciated and long overdue. Conservationists with the Center for Biological Diversity say fortifying the border is, quote, disturbing and a danger to native animals. However, during her visit near Yuma, Secretary Nielsen reiterated that the Trump administration fully intends to move forward. But we will not be discouraged or dissuaded from our need to secure the border, and we will take every step possible to secure our nation. In San Luis, Arizona, Lillian Donahue, Cronkite News. Makes martial art events mean big money and big crowds. But without proper oversight, they can be unsafe and even illegal. Coming up on Cronkite News, an exclusive investigation of unsanctioned cage fights happening every week in the Valley. And vinyl records are not only making a pop culture comeback, but a sustainable one. We'll show you how next. I'm Judy Woodruff, anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. The journalists of tomorrow face a fast-changing media landscape, but quality news remains vitally important to our communities, our country, and our world. At ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, students learn solid, reliable reporting, holding the powerful accountable, and rebuilding the public's trust. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS preparing the next generation for a stronger future of journalism. An exclusive Cronkite News investigation has found a Phoenix strip club is running an unsanctioned female cage fighting operation. It was our own reporter, Tyler Paley, who brought this case to the state's attention. Tyler, what's the latest? Nicole, it started with a tip from a source, and after a four-month investigation, the Arizona Gaming Department confirmed to Cronkite News that this club is a repeat offender. This scene is at Jaguars, an adult entertainment club near the I-17 and McDowell in Phoenix. Cell phone video filmed by Cronkite News on January 25th shows two females fighting in a makeshift octagon cage, with patrons cheering them on. The battles are marketed as ultimate stripper cage fights and take place every Thursday night, according to advertisements on the club's Facebook page. But Caroline Oppelman from the Arizona Department of Gaming says these fights are not sanctioned by the agency's Boxing and MMA Commission. We regulate and supervise all sanctioned uh, boxing and MMA events it, uh, conducted statewide here in Arizona. Oppelman says these activities are illegal. The club could be guilty of a class two misdemeanor. But for Oppelman, the legal ramifications are secondary to the safety hazards in play. You face serious bodily injury and potential other uh, illnesses associated with bloodborne pathogens and one emergency room visit that, that, you, that could end up affecting you for the rest of your life. Gaming department records provided to Cronkite News show an anonymous complaint was lodged in early March 2017 in reference to the fights. Two and a half weeks later, special agents from the gaming department entered the club. They observed an unsanctioned uh, cage fight. About two weeks later, gaming department officials made contact with John Allen, the manager of the club. Agents told Allen Jaguars was violating the law and were seeking willful compliance for the club to cease and desist the illegal activity of hosting unsanctioned cage fights. Allen agreed to stop the fights immediately. A notice of inspection was issued, and at that point, the case was closed. But new information shows Jaguars was conducting these fights as recently as this April. Records show special agents again entered the club on April 5th and observed two matches that evening. They did not observe any medical staff on site, and the referee was not believed to be properly licensed. Agents returned to the club the following day and again issued a notice of inspection, this time to day shift manager Isaiah Scayardo Jr., who said he did not have the authority to stop the fights and would have to contact his boss, Ricardo Hernandez. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, this message is for Ricardo Hernandez. My name is Cronkite Ricardo News left a voicemail with Hernandez, but as of this broadcast, he did uh, not respond to our request for comment. While the gaming department itself can't press criminal charges, Oppelman says they prefer education over prosecution, despite it being the second violation for Jaguars. All that we can do is, is provide the establishment with the information about what is a violation and what 
they could be looking at if they continue to violate. But Caroline, you just said that, that when you find out this information, at some point you do pass it along to lawyers. I'm just wondering at what point that is, at what it's, point? It's our understanding from the visit that they intend to discontinue these activities and their intention is to comply. And as of now, the case is open and they will keep it open until uh, they determine what further actions might be needed. As of now, the Arizona Department of Gaming has not passed this information on to prosecutors. The state cannot press criminal charges until they do so. In the, in the broadcast center, Tyler Paley, Cronkite News. Arizona farmers are already feeling the pressure from President Trump's latest decision on tariffs. Coming up on Cronkite News, how the impending trade war could cost big bucks for those in Arizona and across the United States. And Mother Nature's bringing the heat, I'll tell you when, coming up. I'm Ted Simons, host and managing editor of Arizona Horizon. Join us each weekday at 5.30 and 10 as we bring you the top newsmakers who impact the state. We cover the stories in depth that shape and affect our local communities, and we take the time to ensure that all voices are equally heard. For more than 30 years, Arizona Horizon has been your voice and your source for what matters most, right here on Arizona PBS. I'm Matt Berry, ESPN Sports Center anchor and graduate of ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. With its bachelor's and master's degrees in sports journalism, the Cronkite School is preparing the next generation of sports journalists to tell stories that matter, stories that excite, inspire, and inform. Cronkite immerses students in covering sports at all levels in one of the country's top sports markets. It's this hands-on experience under the guidance of award-winning sports media veterans that shape the top journalist of tomorrow. Tariff talks heating up. President Trump is one signature away from imposing more tariffs on China. And it's a move some members of the Arizona farming community fear will result in a trade war. Cronkite News reporter Adriana D'Alba reports. For four generations, Kevin Rogers and his family have kicked the dirt in these fields as farmers. It's been a great lifestyle for us and to be able to grow up um, on our farms and know that what we do really does matter is heartwarming. But as a grower of alfalfa, cotton and other exported goods, he says he fears the impact of a potential trade war. Trade's important to our industry because a lot of our items are perishable. And we've got to get them to where the people are so that we can all continue to, to help feed the world, feed ourselves and stay in business. Some products China plans to impose tariffs on include cotton, beef, soybeans, and pork, all a big part of Arizona's agricultural industry. Higher tariffs would not only hurt farmers, the impact would be felt by Arizona's economy and its consumers as well. According to the Arizona Farm Bureau, nearly 25% of agriculture produced in the state is exported abroad, and China happens to be the second largest export market. Even though we're not technically in a trade war yet, <laughs> um, farmers are already feeling the impact of, of just the talk and the fact that commodity prices have fallen fallen already, banks are hesitating on loans. Rogers hasn't been impacted by the talk of tariffs yet. He believes there needs to be change when it comes to global trade with China, though he's worried about the tone. Ooh, the conversation's good, but the the uh, gamesmanship is a little bit tough. The discussion's good, needs to happen. It's when it affects the markets as much as it has, that's when our antennas go up. But despite this, Rogers and his family say they will keep working the land, growing crops both for the U.S. and beyond. For Cronkite News, I'm Adriana de Alba. The American Lung Association reported that air quality in Arizona has improved since 1990. The population of the state has increased by 82 percent, but air pollution has dropped by 62 percent. Arizona has improved its air quality, but some counties across the state received an F grade for their number of days with high pollution. This week has been pleasant here in the valley, but the dust and wind are back, and Nicole is tracking the latest for us in the Weather Center. Nicole? Yeah, Gabe, a bunch of warnings across the state today. We are seeing this red flag warning taking a predominant portion of our state. That's going to be up until 8 p.m. And then up here in this corner, these are our dust storm warnings as well. So you want to make sure that if you're driving out there, you want to make sure you pull aside and stay alive. And we're also going to be having high winds in the high country as well. And because of that dust, our air quality is going to be moderate for today. So you want to make sure if you're sensitive, you're being careful to that. But luckily, we're going to be seeing those 
warmer temperatures come back, but tomorrow we're going to drop. We're seeing this low pressure system um, and cold front and warm come in, and that's going to bring cooler temperatures for tomorrow. Our high is going to be 78 degrees, sunny skies, calmer winds, and we are seeing these below average temperatures. And then for our seven day forecast, starting out your weekend is going to be super nice tomorrow, 78 degrees, but then come our weekend, we're dropping back and up, up into those 90s, and we're going to be staying in those 90s throughout the rest of the week, and even with a high of 97 on Wednesday. For the past 11 years, sales for vinyl records increased in the U.S. Reporter Abdel Jimenez visited a Tucson record company that takes a new spin on the century-old tradition. Mirrors, CDs, DVDs, picnic plates, and plexiglass. You might think it's unusual to create records from these materials, but it's Michael Dixon's passion. I love to actually let trash determine the direction of a project. One of his companies, People in a Position to Know, makes unique records for artists, from the discs to the packaging, using repurposed materials. I went to the plastics company where I buy all my plastic in Olympia, Washington, back when I was first starting, and they had a lot of strips of acrylic mirror. These were just leftovers from another job that they had. And I bought all of the all of the strips that they had and cut them into seven inch discs. Dixon also owns a company that cuts vinyl records, which he says is doing well because of the resurgence of vinyl. Vinyl record companies made $14.3 million last year in the US, according to Statista, an online research firm. But Dixon prefers working with the non-traditional materials, such as lathe cuts, which are made out of plexiglass. A third company of his focuses solely on that format. They sound pretty dang good considering they're plexiglass. Because working with these unusual materials takes a lot longer than vinyl, he can't produce mass amounts. Instead, Dixon sells limited copies to both artists and consumers. It doesn't bring in much money, but he does love the artistic process. As, as long as I can continue to make records for a living, I will. In Tucson, Cronkite News, Abdel Jimenez. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpps.org.